think it fits very well with our next presentation with the idea of um, being learning for all and that what we do for people with disabilities can benefit very often for people who have disabilities that if we improve the, the learning situation for one group of people well the other group benefits also people with disabilities migrants people that don't know the language and uh, rural people and with that idea i will leave the floor to Ms. Lane clayton who is uh, working at uh, um, education in belgium and she's presenting innovative bank for learning Everybody, uh, is this okay? Because I don't like to speak with a microphone, but I will do it. Um, I have been working with Tim in the INVEST program uh, project, which is one of the projects that was um, in the ALDO project. And in this project, we work together with four vocational schools in four countries, and we um, sort of investigated the universal design concept and we explore to see if this uh, way of working, in, and I will explain what it is, huh? if it makes any difference in uh, inclusive teaching in vocational schools. So that's the link with the ALDO project. So I'm going to explain to you about universal design, and I plan to tell you the following. So I would like to uh, explain some foundations of universal design. Um, I, would, I would like to talk to you about learners' variability um, and about uh, lesson designs and strategies. I would like to go a little bit into neuroscience, just a little bit, because from there on I would like to, to talk about universal design for learning, which is the universal design applied to learning and teaching, and we have guidelines for that. Uh, I would like to go into UDL and differentiation, and a little bit into technology, and then questions and answers. And I was really very fascinated in hearing uh, you talk, because there were some things that I said, oh yes, this is an example, oh yes, this is an example. So I hope it, is, it will be recognizable for you, okay? Um, so the foundations of universal design. So universal design uh, was a, a sort of um, a new way of thinking in architecture in the 60s. This happened in the United States when there was a lot of war veterans coming back from the wars um, and they couldn't access buildings. That's basic basically how it started. So the first foundation was how can we make our buildings and our services more accessible? Okay, so I will give you some examples. Um, so not only, uh, so in, in that case, Accessibility not only for the average user, but for all users, okay? So this is an example. This is the, the time when the ramps were developed, yeah? The, uh, this is an example from a museum where you have the choice. It's also a very important uh, foundations on universal design that you can choose. Uh, if you have a, a need, uh, originally the ramp was, was uh, developed for people in wheelchairs, but if I'm tired of, uh, I have knee problems, I prefer also that ramp. This is the, uh, a nice example of a train, not in Belgium, because in Belgium you need to, ha you need be you need to be an acrobat in able to go into the train. <laughs> but it's a, yeah, but thi this, this is how it should be, right? Okay, so this is all about accessibility, but not only in buildings, but also in services. For instance, if I would be in a country that I have no idea about the language and I need to go to the toilet, I will be very glad to see that pictogram. So that's also an example of accessibility. This is a, a metro. Uh, so they don't, they don't only use the colors, but they also use symbols. It's not very visible maybe, but they have a symbol of, a, I think, a turtle here and so if you, 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 you're not, you don't understand the colors, then you can always look at the symbols or you can look at the words. I know that I'm saying something now maybe a little bit in contradiction with what you were saying, but I'll, I'll come to that later on, okay? Because I do agree with you about focus and uh, how did you call it? Um, single media or 
Okay, so I'll come to that. So anyway, this is another example of um, a metro map that's accessible for all users, right? The second foundation of universal design is that it's a benefit for all. And here again, I, I, I really saw some nice examples of, of what you were saying. Um, for instance, this is uh, one of the new swimming pools where normally the ramp was again designed for people in wheelchairs, but we see all kinds of people using it, people with small children, old, old people, and so on. So this is an example of a benefit for all. That's another one, the great invention of the automatic doors. I think all of us are very happy with them, as if we have our luggage and our, or our, our uh, prams or whatever. Pram, you say it like that? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then a third foundation is a proactive design. So um, to begin with, a proactive design, if you think upfront about an accessible design, it will be much more nicer and more efficient than if you retrofit, okay? I will give you some examples. This is retrofitting. This is what we see a lot in Belgium. You, know? you have this old building, and you need to be able to make it accessible for everybody. And so what happens at the, at the back of the building, they, they make this ugly ramp, <laughs> and people in wheelchairs have to even uh, n um, use a longer distance to get into the building. So that's, well, it's the only thing you can do. And this is the other example. If you have a pre-design, if you think upfront about how am I going to make my building accessible, then you have this, which is in an architectural point of view, of course, much more nicer to look at, but also much more efficient. Okay? Pardon? It does, doesn't it? But you, you see them coming. I, I saw them in, in, in Belgium, in England. So I think people are, you know, it's also, uh, it's much more, uh, it, it doesn't cost that much also, I think, eh, if you can do it up front. So we have these three foundations. Oh, this is another one, but maybe you know this one. It's a really classical one. What we see happen is that most of the time they start shoveling the snow on the stairs. But why not shovel the snow on the ramp so everybody can go in? So why not doing the obvious? Okay, so these three foundations, the accessibility, the design, uh, the benefit for all, and the pre-design, uh, if you apply all that to teaching and learning, then you have your universal design for learning. Okay. Now, this is a framework that, as I said, it has emerged from, from America, where uh, a group of designers were thinking about, um, well, they were, it was at that time that the edu uh, individual educational plans were developed, and it was a lot of work for teachers. And then they said, why not do, do it the other way around? Why not take another focus? And I'm going to try to explain that. Thinking about accessibility, thinking about benefits for all, thinking about a pre-design. Does it make sense up to here? OK, thank you. So I'm going to, if, if that's OK, Tim, because I'm looking at the time, I, I really would like to share a little TED Talk with you. I'm um, fond of TED Talks. I mean, the good ones, you know, TED. Yeah, OK. So this is um, uh, about the myth of the average shoe. And the person that is going to do the TED Talk is uh, a person with ADHD. So he really talks rather fast, but I think you will, it will be uh, accessible, I think. Yeah? But he's actually a dropout. He was a dropout from secondary school. And he was one of those guys that really, really wanted to achieve in learning. So he went back to school, and at this moment he's a professor in Harvard. So he's really one of those people that didn't give up. It's an old TED talk. He will say something about an, an Olympic champion. That's really <laughs> 10 or 20 years, uh, 10 years ago. But so, but it, I think it's still a, a really good movie to look at. I'm not, I'm not going to present it all. So at, at a certain moment, I'm going to stop it. Okay.
job, so you have to bear with me. <laughs> so what he does is, he's, um, his message actually is that, um, I want to put it up because otherwise I'm talking together with him. Yeah. Wait, wait. Yeah, well, so his, his, his basic message is that if we, if we see variability, we design for it. So, and what it does is, he says, imagine a world where um, the shoe is designed for the average shoe uh, size. So let's just say that all of you would be in here because you have a, sh a shoe size eight and a half, or I don't know how much in European, uh, like 38 or, or 40, okay? So if we would do that, it would mean that we would uh, not recognize a lot of talent because if you would be a really good sprinter, like Usain Bolt, and that, that's the um, example that he's giving, Usain Bolt, if he, if he had to fit in a shoe size eight and a half, he would not be able to win the Olympics. So that's sort of the connection that he makes. And then he goes on to the Rubik's, Rubik's group. And that's why I'm, I feel so bad that you couldn't see it because he shows a design for the blind, which is a white cube with only braille on it. And he says, that's good for people who are blind, but then the people who see, they don't have, they cannot use it. So then you have to design two rubrics. So you see, so I'm, I'm not saying it very well because I was not prepared to t tell about it, but that was actually what the TED Talk is about. And maybe you can provide the link that you can see it at home. Um, so the, the message actually is that, um, as I said, I don't, this doesn't work anymore. Okay, so the message is we design for variability if we see it. So the, sh the shoes we see, we see that every, every one of us has a different size, but the way that we learn, that's from the inside, and the way that we think, that's also from the inside. And then we have a m far more difficulty to design for it. Does that make sense to you, this message? Yes. Okay, so um, what we see is we have the average learner, yeah? Uh, and then we have all those in the margins. Uh, we have the gifted children, we have children with different backgrounds, we have learners with a, a special educational s uh, needs statement, we have those without a statement, we have students from different cultures, and so on and so on. So the question is, we cannot talk about an average learner, and that's, that's the basic message if you think about uh, the foundations of universal design. So this is the basic message of we have, we do not have an average learner. This is a myth, okay? Did I explain it well, Tim? Because I have to <laughs> do something I didn't prepare for anyway. Okay, so um, another message that uh, the person from the TED Talk wanted to give is that um, people who do this uh, task, they can use different strategies. Some of them, they use algorithms in their head. There are others that do trial and errors, and so on, and so on. And this is also something that um, if we teach, we should provide different strategies for students to learn, and not just one strategy, okay? And I will give you another example. This is a, a little story about uh, a king who wanted to have a path from his castle. Let me just show you that castle again. He wanted to come from the castle to the river, and he said to his architects, I want you to design a path. And he didn't say how, and he didn't give material, and he didn't give, give uh, methods. He just said, you give me a good design. So the three architects gave three fantastic designs. And one of them was a fast path for when the king wanted to, be to go to the river really fast, so that was the straight one. Yeah. And then there was a challenging path for when he wants to work out. So that was the one that goes into the mountain. And then there's another one who's a beautiful path for when the king wanted to enjoy nature. So if he would have said to the architect, I want you to design uh, using this and this and this and this, it would have been much more restricted. So does this also make sense to you, I hope? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then you have different ways to assess what you have, to, uh, have been teaching. So you have your formative assess. This is about the project, uh, the process, of course, and there's the summative. So this is about the result, OK? 
okay? So I think this one is familiar for you also, isn't it, or not? Because we use it a lot in Belgium. So this is actually saying what I mean with one picture. Huh? Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to do the same assessment for all these animals. Okay? Saying, prove to me that you can climb that tree. Um, this is the exam. So uh, this is also a point for universal design for learning. Please let students prove what they have learned in different ways, not in one fixed way, which is designed again for the average learner. Okay. So, and as an another um, sort of element of universal design is that we should give learners enough support. This is where the word scaffolding comes into place. Have you are you familiar with that term? Yes. So, providing temporary supports to reach a goal, and then eventually you can leave out the support. And this is also something, uh, again, I, I recognize in your story, you do not give that support only for those who have special educational needs, but you provide them for the whole classroom, providing that you keep your learning goal high. And this is, I think, I was talking to uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Doreen, I think it was, and we were thinking about this is the main challenge for, for, for teachers. How much support can I give without lowering my learning goal? So this is something that you need to think all the time. Am I, by giving this support, lowering my objective? Because this is not what you want. Okay? Now, within the Universal Design for Learning framework, you will still need some uh, accommodations, some individual accommodations. Although, if I again heard your story, I, I wonder if that still will be. Um, let's say that in 100 years, uh, up till now, you have uh, deaf children in your classroom who may have cochlear implants, but maybe some of them will still need uh, gestures and sign language, but maybe when technology becomes so good and so uh, advanced, then maybe it will not be needed anymore. But at this point, and this was also something that we investigated in, um, in the INVEST project, we sort of made a list of the, the, the individual accommodations that were in place for the students with, with special educational needs. And after three years, we, we, we sort of made another list and saw if the list of accommodations was getting less, uh, was getting smaller. So that was what we uh, actually thought in the beginning. If we have a good universal design, then maybe the list of individual accommodations will become shorter. In my opinion, more feasible and achievable for a teacher. Okay, does it still make sense? Yeah. So, now this little bit of neuroscience. Uh, it's, uh, I think you said it in your question that uh, we know now that parts of the brain work together and are integrated. Now, um, I will show you in a minute a tool for this universal design for learning. It's a tool that teachers can use to see if they really uh, make accessible learning and uh, design for learner variability. Now, this is um, in our learning, we use an effective network. Yeah, which is really, if, if you see where it, where it is located, it's really very important because it influences everything. This has to do with motivation, with being engaged in the classroom, and so on. Then you have your recognition network. If you do not recognize what the teacher is saying or teaching, you cannot learn. And then you have your strategic network. If you do not know how to learn, you will not learn. Now, these three networks, they are, of course, integrated. Okay, so this is all I'm going to say about, about um, the neuroscience. If you have these three uh, networks, if you keep them in mind, then the institute has designed some sort of framework translated into guidelines. Okay, and you have in your, on your left side, you have all guidelines you have to do with engagement. So multiple ways to engage your learners in the classroom. The second one I'm going to explain more in detail. The middle one is about multiple ways to represent what you are teaching. Okay? And the right one is providing multiple means for action and expression. And I will give you some examples. 
So the first one was the engagement. And I always put this first because I think if students are not engaged in the classroom, they will not learn, okay? So for instance, optimize choice and autonomy. And this is something that I was thinking when you said we want to uh, have a single media use or just uh, one focus that maybe the word choice would come into place here because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that maybe some students would like both. And that's where the autonomy comes into place. So this is just an example of the guidelines on, ex on, on engagement. Optimize relevance. And then I'm thinking about refugees. If they come here and maybe they, they have never been to school, some of them have never been to school, have, don't have any school education, then we need to adapt our teaching because if it's not relevant for them, they will not learn, okay? Uh, minimize threats, yeah, that I think that's, uh, that's an obvious one that in the classroom, student needs to feel safe, okay? Now, I was only talking about those three bottom guidelines. It was just to give you, you, to give you an idea of the framework because normally I spend the whole day talking about it, eh, but in 40 minutes, I warned you, eh? <laughs> Okay, so then the middle one, I'm sorry, the middle one was um, multiple ways of representation. Again, offer ways of customizing the display of information, offer alternatives for auditory information, and offer alternatives for visual information. This is only, again, the bottom uh, guidelines. And here, I do agree with you that there's a danger here, because sometimes we see that teachers who are just learning how to, to use universal design for learning, that they, they overdo it. So you have an overwhelming scale of uh, information in the classroom, and I do agree that gives the opposite as effect. So here, this is a, a recognizable set of guidelines, but there's a, there's a danger in it. You need, to be, uh, you, need, you need to have economy of scale, or I don't know how you, how you call it, that you do not use too many uh, senses at the same time. And then you have your uh, multiple means of action and expression, and this has to do with vary the, the methods of response. So uh, I, I have a lot of, uh, well, I used to have a lot of experience with working with uh, children with aut autism spectrum disorders, and I know that <coughs> if you have only one way of doing your test or your assessment, that I'm sure a lot of students will fail the test, although you know that they know it. So this is uh, one of the, of the things that uh, a teacher needs to consider, that there needs to be multiple ways to prove that you have what you have learned. Okay? Optimize access to tools and assistive technology. So you see, the whole set of guidelines is like a tool for teachers to design their lessons. I hope I, I'm, I, I brought that message over that you know what I'm talking about, okay? Maybe something about differentiation. I think all of you know about differentiation. Um, this is a sort of a black and white comparison. So first of all, in universal designs for learning, your focus is the learning environment and the curriculum. Making the learning environment and the curriculum accessible. Yeah? In differentiation, the focus is more on the unique learning profile of each student. So it's a little bit black and white, uh, but, uh, but that's basically what the mind shift is about. In UDL, you have multiple methods available for all learners. In differentiation, the way that in lots of, of classes in Belgium it is done like that, in practice, often individualized learning methods, saying that this is a child with this problem or this way of learning, so I'm going to, to do for this child this way of, uh, of teaching. Okay. Um, universal design is a proactive design to meet most needs and expe expectations stay high. In differentiation, it's more like a retrofitting. Okay, you, re you remember with the stairs, yeah? What could lead to lower expectations? I'm 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 a little bit um, how can I say? Uh, um, what is it? Uh, no. Uh, Careful, sorry. I'm a little bit careful here because it's not like that all the time, but there's a risk. If you say upfront, this is a student with autism and I'm going to differentiate my teaching, it might lead to 
lowering your expectations. There's a danger in that. And then for the universal design for learning, diversity is the norm. Yeah? And barriers for learning come from a one-size-fits-all. Yeah? And in differentiations, the barriers for learning are put <coughs> at the child and not at the learning environment. Okay, so what is the solution then? I think you should start with a universal design of your classroom and then differentiation will still be necessary because you can't fix everything and you don't have to fix everything. So this is a little bit how uh, the two concepts uh, are, uh, let's say, compared to each other. I know there's a, a big discussion that could go on now, but uh, I don't we don't have the time for that, I think. Yeah? And then maybe something about technology. It is not true that, need that teachers need technology to make a universal design classroom. Yeah? I, s I saw some beautiful examples of schools who didn't, didn't have any technology at all. Hmm? But of course, technology can make your learning environment more rich. That is true. But this is a new device. I don't know if people have been to the Louvre lately. I've been uh, like a year ago. They had at that time it was the new device, and it was <coughs> absolutely inaccessible. I couldn't. It took me an hour before I could figure out what the different items were and the different uh, features. And there was like a three-dimensional thing and whatever. And in the beginning, it really made me feel my, my self-esteem was really low because I thought, oh my God, I'm getting old and, and I don't understand anything. And then I saw that all the people in, 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 the I mean in my environment were having the same problem. So in this case, this was not accessible technology, so that's not UDL. Okay? So again, UDL is not primarily about uh, technology, it's about pedagogy. But if you have the technology that's accessible, and I heard you say that also, many times, then I think it's a, it's a universal design, okay? So normally, there was another picture, uh, another movie, but no, s no, if you don't have sound, it's, it's not going to happen, eh? But this was just sort of a wrapping up of, of, uh, of the things that I have been talking about. M let me give it a try, eh? I don't know if we have the time. learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal design for learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word you
wonders of modern technology. Yeah. While I suggest we put the link to the website. Yeah. We'll hold, because I know there will be questions for Marty. So we'll hold those. We'll have a quick coffee for five minutes. We'll let that run and buffer for five minutes. And then let it play. And then we'll provide the links as well. Thank you for your understanding. Um, when we left this, Marlene was just going to show us um, a cartoon around U around UDL in, in, in kind of action. Um, so we are, we, are con we are certain that it's going to work and work flawlessly. And after which we'll have a couple of questions then for, for Marlene before you move on to our final two speakers of the day. All right, so thank you very much. And Seamlessly into a questions session from Marlene. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Thank you. Um, I don't know if it's if it's the same in uh, every country, but here in Belgium, uh, people tend, uh, teachers tend to uh, uh, hold on to teachers' manuals, uh, curriculum guides, and everything. Um, is there the people who design uh, those kind of? course guides, are they aware of this this kind of uh, UDL? Um, is there a way to influence them so that um, from top down the same uh, ideals will reach the teachers? <coughs> I don't know. Yeah, that would be, wouldn't it? In Belgium, we well, we have uh, the ANTERMA, which are the, s the national standards who are really very, not very defined and very detailed, but then they are translated into these curriculum goals, and they are in the books. And you, as you can imagine, if a teacher just holds on to the books, there will not be a lot of, uh, of di uh, diversity in his teaching. And that's what we try to convince teachers and teacher trainers, that, uh, that okay, you can have your working, your, your learning uh, methods, reading methods, but that there's that's only one way, but it's very difficult. I don't know about other countries, but I do know that in the teacher training uh, um, universities that they do uh, try to train the teachers in doing the UDL way, but then in the real life when, that when a young teacher comes to a school and there's the old teacher teaching to the average, and I'm saying it a little bit impolite now, but this is the way that they were trained, that it's very hard to to sort of do the other movement. I don't know about other countries. 
So um, I think I, I see a lot of UDL examples, uh, but it is not named that way very often. Like you didn't say universal design for learning, did you? But you did talk about the benefit for, for the others and things like that. So I think little by little, um, and it is not, a, uh, as I said, for differentiation, it's not an, an or story, eh? it's and. I think first you design for your whole classroom and then absolutely differentiation will be needed, I'm sure. Well, that's that's one of the, the questions we have, we often get. Is this research? But of course, this whole concept you cannot research it. I mean, it would not be very ethical, would it? I mean, if you would, on the one hand, have a classroom, doing it this way, but but items of it, like for instance, peer learning, peer teaching, um, the assessment part, like self-assessment, uh, and all these uh, components of universal design for learning, they have been researched. So. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there? And I yeah. Before we do the last exercises, <laughs> uh, I would like to get your realistic judgment about the balance between universal design and IT needs, IT support, IT uh, equipment, and working of that. Because we had in the, ex in the, in the past <coughs> tried to use the, um, the IT equipment uh, and the software in order to improve uh, existing documents for uh, 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 supporting uh, a learning process for disabled people and realize that if you go far from the town to the rural areas, and even far from that, uh, that the um, possibilities to use uh, IT, fast IT, fast internet, are very, very limited. And therefore, I think, uh, I believe that UDL is clearly the, the main topic. But for most of the applications, we need IT. <coughs> and here I see problems, yes, that even if there is a very rapid and advanced um, development uh, in reality, in practice, it doesn't work always. I agree with you, but uh, as I said, I think if you have good technology, then it will, it will, it will reach your, it make your learning environment richer, but it, you do not need it. This example, again, I'm sorry if I'm always talking about you, but I was so inspired, <laughs> but talking about writing on the blackboard and saying at the same time what you are, s what you are ri uh, writing and maybe uh, give a little story uh, as an example of what it's about. That's also universal design for learning and you don't need the technology to do it. I, can, I, I, I went to study trips and I saw districts of schools that didn't have any technology at all. These were really uh, low, how can I say, um, in, in setback areas in the United States where I saw beautiful examples no technology, nothing. And then in other schools where they have a lot of technology and it was not UDL. So, I mean, if you have both, it's good. But it's not a precondition. Does that answer your question a little bit? Or? No, it's, I don't think so, no. And that's a little bit of a misunderstanding. If you heard about UDL, you automatically think about apps and about ICT, and this is only one part, because I think it's the mind shift of teachers that say the barriers are in your learning environment and in your curriculum. And in the curriculum, I mean the objectives, the material, the methods, and the assessment. And, and it's the mind shift that, that if you design upfront for your diversity in the classroom, you will need less accommodations and individual accommodations in the end. That's the hypothesis. Do I say that right? Hypothesis is a difficult word. But anyway, that is the, the, the way that it's like a mind shift. Start the other way around. And, and, and uh, maybe one more example. When I was doing my work with uh, teachers who were having children with uh, autism spectrum disorders in the classroom, and, and I said to them, listen, you have to design. And this is like 20 years ago. The universal design for learning didn't exist yet. 
and and we wanted to make an autism friendly environment saying that everything is clear there's um, a lot of uh, clarification in the space in time and you do that for the whole classroom you will see that a lot of learners will benefit from that and that sort of made them look at it the other way around does that answer your question yeah so I don't say that technology it, it, it's it makes it easier but on the other hand there's a danger because I, I saw teachers overdoing it and then there's overwhelming a lot of of input and especially for some students this is not good so that's where the choice comes into place I think yeah absolutely yeah absolutely Well, that's what I said with my last sentence. Eh? UDL is not primarily about technology, it's about pedagogy. And then, okay, so, any? Thanks very much, Marlene. That was, as expected, that was uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. Sorry again about the wonders of modern technology. We were talking about technology not moving out into rural areas.